Okay, we are live now. And I suggest we start. Okay, so hello, we greet you at another edition of the One World Youngstats webinar series. The series is part of the Youngstats project, which is um, takes part uh, in the Young Statisticians Europe initiative of the Fain Stats Association and is supported by Bernoulli Society for Mathematical Statistics and Probability, as well as the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, IMS, Today, um, as I mentioned, we have the topic, uh, um, recent advances in extreme value theory, and I greatly thank colleague from Youngstas Editorial, Alessia, Alessia, Dr. Alessia Caponera, who will naturally um, take over the full webinar, and uh, I leave the word to you, Alessia, and thank greatly for the preparation of the webinar. Thanks. Thank you, Andre. Uh, today, I'm really uh, pleased to introduce the three speakers, which are uh, Stefano Rizzelli, Nicola Agnecco, and Jonathan Co, and the discussant Sebastian Engelke. So I will just uh, briefly introduce them, and then I will leave them the floor. So Stefano uh, Rizzelli has got his PhD at Bocconi University in 2019, and is it? Is, he is currently assistant professor at the Department of Statistical Sciences in Cattolica University of Milan. Nicola Gnecco, the second speaker, he got his PhD at University of Geneva in 2022, and he is currently a postdoctoral researcher at Copenhagen Causality Lab in University of Copenhagen. And the third speaker is uh, Jonathan Co. With he got his PhD at EPFL in 2022, and is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Oshger Osh Center for Climate Change Research uh, in University of Berg. And we are we are also blessed to have with us the discussant, as I said, Sebastian Engelke, which is uh, one of the leading scientists in the field of extreme value theory, the the, the topic of our webinar today. And he is an associate professor of statistics at the Research Center of Statistics in University of Geneva. And he is also the member of the executive committee of the Bernoulli Society as a membership secretary. And uh, now uh, uh, we can start with the, with the first speaker, which, as I said, is Stefano. So Stefano, could you, can you please share your screen? Sure. Can you see it correctly? Yes, please. You should now go full screen. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, yeah. So, Stefano will talk about mathematical foundation of empirical base and analysis of maxima. Please, Stefano, the floor is yours. So, many thanks, Alessia, for organizing this webinar, and many thanks to Sebastian for agreeing being a discussant. So uh, what I'm going to present today is part of the output of a research stream um, of an, I mean, uh, obtained an investigation carried out jointly with Simone Paduan at Bocconi University. And uh, for the sake of time, let me jump straight to the framework I'm going to consider today, that is inference uh, on maxable distributions based on maxima. Now, as I guess many people in the audience already know quite well, one of the most common inferential frameworks in multivariate extreme value analysis concerns analysis of component-wise maxima, which in the simplest setup are computed component-wise over blocks of uh, IID random vector X, whose distribution F0 is assumed to be in the domain of attraction of the max stable distribution. The T's, uh, we assume that there exists uh, uh, sequences BM and AM such that the vector of maxima uh, suitably normalized and computed over an increasing block of sides M, which goes to infinity, has a distribution which quickly converges to G0. Now, this is type of assumption is typically used as a justification for uh, the use of a 
max table uh, statistical model for the analysis of maxima, including location and scale parameters to account for these are no known mean sequences AM and BM. Yet note that for finite block sizes M, which is what we need to consider in practice, the max table uh, model is typically misspecified. Now, from the estimation viewpoint, estimates uh, of functional so max table distributions can also be used to estimate quantities uh, which relate to features of the tail of the original uh, distribution of zero, generating the underlying uh, observations axis, such as probability of, of having, let's say, at least one exceedance above a large quantile for at least one of the components of the random vector X. For example, at least a very large loss on at least one stock in a portfolio, uh, stock price uh, in a portfolio of stocks, okay? Now, uh, in other problems, the main uh, goal of the analysis is to forecast future extreme values. And alongside uh, point prediction, also we want to provide suitable uncertainty measures, okay? Consequently, it is often desirable to issue forecasts in a probabilistic format, that is taking the form of a an entire probability distribution over future quantities, okay? From which, for example, we can extract uh, um, predictive regions or intervals, okay? So it's nice to, to go for probabilistic forecasting. Now, this partly motivates the increasing popularity of Bayesian approaches as they provide a natural framework for probabilistic forecasting through posterior predictive distributions. Yet, when uh, Simone and I started studying these methods, we had the feeling that uh, um, the, the potential of Bayesian methods for the analysis of extreme was not fully exploited. And also we noticed that there was no mathematical result providing guarantees on the accuracy of inferential results. And uh, we think that uh, the, the reason why is mostly due to the following uh, three factors. So first of all, um, the class of uh, multivariate max table uh, distributions is infinite dimensional because the corresponding class of copulas cannot be fully described in parametric terms. Now, from this viewpoint, Bayesian non or semi parametric methods are quite appealing because they are flexible. They don't require you to uh, focus on a sub model for the dependent structure. On the other hand, studying uh, the asymptotic behavior is quite complicated. It's quite, it's quite complex. The more so uh, if we account for the fact that for finite block sizes M, the max table model is misspecified. Of course, if, the if we let the block size grow, uh, the effects of uh, uh, misspecification are mitigated. But still, uh, if, uh, if we want to do a proper asymptotic analysis, we must account for this model convergence bias and uh, tune, uh, let's say, uh, modify standard techniques for uh, Bayesian asymptotics for Bayesian non-parametric methods accordingly, okay? Finally, it is difficult to uh, specify a proper prior on uh, marginal scale location parameters, uh, which should account for information on the um, norming sequences AM and BM, since typically a priori, we don't have sufficient prior information on these quantities. Okay, so summing up, the three main sources of difficulties that we encountered are complexity of the dependent structure, misspecification of the used model, and uh, lack of sufficient prior information on uh, marginal tail behaviors. So the uh, empirical based recipe that I'm going to present in the, next in the next slides is taught as a first attempt to tackle these three problems simultaneously and provide, let's say, a method which produces consistent posterior distributions and posterior predictive distributions with which accurate predictive inference can be uh, carried out. Okay, so let's now see which are the main ingredients of this recipe. So the first ingredient is a, a max stable model. As I said, it's gonna be considered as a misspecified model for finite block sizes. And in particular, uh, we focus on a semi-parametric model, including a finite dimensional parameter theta in blue. This guy here collects all the parameters from the marginal distributions. 
and then infinite dimensional parameter eta which is named angular probability measure and is in particular a probability measure on the unit simplex or dimension d uh, whose marginal distributions satisfy a specific mean constraints that is marginal means for this distribution of one over d where d is a dimension of the vector of maximum we are analyzing okay and uh, for simplicity we are considering a subclass of all the valid angular probability measures in particular those which allow the representation at point A. So let me illustrate this in the simpler case of D equal three. What we are going to do is to allow for probability measures, angular probability measures, which place positive, non-negative, let's say, mass on the vertices of the simplex, assign no mass on the edges, and have an absolutely continuous restriction to the inner region, that is, if we think of y1, y2, y3 as a random vector distributed according to eta, when we drop the third component so that we pass from this space to the space on the right, we get a random vector w1, w2, whose uh, probability measure has a Lebesgue density in this gray triangle. Okay, Such a density will be called uh, angular probability density and will be denoted by lowercase h. As for the marginal distributions, we are going to assume they are, that they are all of the same type. That is, they have the same tail behavior. So we are going to assume that they are either all fresh air, and in this case, we have shape and scale parameters, or all gamble, and in this case, you have scale and location parameters, or all reverse Weibull, or more simply Weibull, with shape, scale, and location parameters. Now, in the first case, you have EV tail distribution. In the second case, the, the, the tail, uh, the tail evidence is a bit different, is lighter. So you have sort of exponential uh, uh, decay of the tails. And in this case, instead, you have short tails. Now, in many uh, applications, uh, assuming a homogeneous state behavior won't be much of a practical restriction. Because, for example, in environmental study, we know that many variables can be described through short tails or exponential type tails. While, for example, in finance or actuarial studies, we know that variables are suitably described by EV tails. Okay. Of course, one could consider uh, the setup uh, where the three tail behaviors are, let's say, simultaneously considered within the class called generalized extreme value distribution. But uh, this scenario is left out from the present study for absolutely non-trivial uh, technical issues, OK? Now, the next, so this is all for the model. The next ingredient is the prior distribution. We're going to assume that the prior distribution on theta and eta is specified in a, let's say, independent fashion. And in particular, as for the final dimensional uh, component, uh, we uh, assume that the prior on uh, location and scale parameter is suitably rescaled and recentered using uh, data uh, dependent quantities. Why it is so? As I said, it is very difficult to specify a genuine proper prior density uh, on location and scale parameters which account for, uh, for information on the norm in sequences. So we do it in a data dependent fashion through these quantities sigma and mu, which are estimators of. AM and BM, which will be assumed to be consistent. Okay. So, in a way, we let the data inform us on these quantities, at least on a, as a first guess. Okay. And then, concerning the parameter, uh, let's say the pi elements, they are all um, kernels, which uh, assume to probability kernels, which are assumed to satisfy loose, reasonably loose regularity properties for the case of fresh air. And gamble margins. While we are going to be a bit more restrictive in the case of um, uh, Weibull margins, because this is the more irregular to cope with the irregularities essentially of these marginal distributions. Notice that this is the only case where the support of the distribution depends on the parameter. So, so this case is a bit nastier. And among others, we are, uh, we are going to assume that the prior is compactly supported. But again, this should not entail a big practical restriction as, for example, quantities uh, in applied sciences typically have a, a uh, reasonably bounded uh, range, okay, physical range. 
Now, second prior we need to specify is on the dependent structure. In particular, we are going to assume that the prior is uh, on the dependent structure is specified using a Bersen polynomial representation of the angular measure, which was firstly introduced by Marcon, uh, Padon, and Antoniano uh, for the bivariate case, and then has been extended by uh, Hanson, De Carvalho, and Chen uh, in arbitrary dimensions. Okay, so the idea is that uh, uh, in this representation, you have like masses on uh, uh, the edges of the, on, on the vertices of the simplex, and uh, the angular, uh, uh, angular density is modeled as a mixture of uh, Dirichlet uh, densities with integer parameters, or equivalently as a, a mixture of uh, Bersen polynomials of, of degree k minus d. Okay, and the idea is that given k, you assign a prior on the mixing coefficient. And then after that, you assign a prior on the polynomial degree in such a way that, uh, or equivalently on k, in such a way that uh, uh, or arbitrarily large k values receive positive probability, but the mass uh, decays at most exponentially. So essentially, this act as a, a penalization to complexity and standard distribution such as a truncated Poisson will do the job. What is a bit more difficult here is to specify a prior on uh, the mixing coefficients given k such that what you obtain with this formula is a valid angular uh, probability me uh, measure that is it satisfies the mean constraints. Examples for priors are, are given in uh, Marcon et al. 2016 and Anson et al. 2017, which are the words I was mentioning before, or who simply specify, be simply specified in a hierarchical fashion. So intuitively, what you would do is to start with mixing weights, which implicitly correspond to a measure which puts all the mass in the interior of the simplex and is not necessarily an angular probability measure. Then you introduce, then you randomly remove some mass from the interior and you reassign it to the vertices in such a way that uh, you end up with a measure which actually satisfies uh, the mean constraints. Okay, so this is the main idea. Now, we have all the ingredients, we have model, that is a likelihood, since the model is dominated. We have a prior, even if a data dependent one and specified in an empirical base, uh, base fa uh, fashion. Now, combining uh, the likelihood and the empirical uh, base prior, we obtain a posterior like distribution. Of course, this is not a genuine Bayesian posterior distribution. It is not exactly a conditional distribution for the parameters theta, eta, given the data, but still uh, it is a um, genuine random probability measure, well-defined random probability measure, and can be used for inference exactly in the same way as a posterior distribution. So it is legitimate to ask now, which are the guarantees that we have when we use this object for inference? We managed to prove that under regularity conditions, this measure will concentrate on sets of theta and theta, such that the shape parameters in all the three setups for marginal distributions are close to their true counterparts. Scale parameters are suitably close to the true uh, scaling sequence and location parameters were present, that is in the uh, Gamble and Weibull case, are suitably close to the true centering sequence. More importantly, I would say, we concentrate all the mass asymptotically on sets of parameters corresponding to max stable distributions in a neighborhood of the true maxima generating density, even if the true maxima generating density is not uh, max stable, okay? Even if the model is misspecified. And we do this uh, considering, for example, strong metrics. So the neighborhood of the true data generating density is considered using strong metrics like the Hellinger or the total variation distance, okay? And what is important here is that this results on concentration of the posterior distribution also guarantee that the posterior predictive density is a consistent estimator of the true density of generating the maxima under the same uh, for under the same matrix. Okay. So in particular, let me recall that uh, the posterior predictive density is nothing but the pointwise expectation of the max stable density with respect to the posterior distribution. Finally, we also consistently retrieve the dependent structure as we can show that the posterior concentrates on sets of angular densities which are in a neighborhood of the true, uh, true one actually, or the true angular measure to be more precise. 
defined by any metric which matrices with convergence. Okay, so some final remarks. Uh, our consistency results provide some mathematical guarantees on the accuracy of uh, uh, inference that you will get if you use this recipe. Um, I don't have time to go into technicalities, but I would just would like to mention that uh, these consistency results that we get are based on a specific form of agreement between the actual law of joint law of the maxima and the law of a, a simple random sample from the limiting maxable distribution. This form of agreement is called remote contiguity and was invented by Bas Klein in 2021. And we managed to prove that under regularity conditions, you have this property for maxima, for the joint law of maxima and the uh, joint law of a limiting maxable sample. Now, I also mentioned that uh, um, here we have discussed mathematical aspects. Uh, practical implementations of this method should not be problematic in uh, moderate dimension. But of course, if you want to go high dimensional, then some careful considerations must, must be done. Okay, and so maybe some changes in this approach must be considered. But if meanwhile you were asking uh, yourself, you were wondering whether this empirical based way of a modeling marginal, um, mar uh, the, the parameters for the marginal distributions is sound, let me just show you some simple uh, result, simulation results that you get if you now fit to univariate maxima, uh, a GV model. So uh, let's say, uh, including all the three possible tail behaviors where you have now a general shape parameter, scale and location, okay? This is just something very simple to conclude the presentation and to convince you that uh, for modeling uh, margins, the empirical based strategy is a good one. So what I'm going to show you is simulation results, in particular, um, Monte Carlo uh, coverage probabilities for the three parameters, gamma zero, BM and, and uh, AM, and the triplet of the three plus estimates of the quantile of the original distribution with which we generate the data. In this case, we have data from a Hulk Cauchy. First, we consider, for example, 20 maxima over blocks of size 40. And already with this moderate sample size, you see that uh, uh, coverage probabilities for credible intervals, which are both symmetric or asymmetric for the parameters gamma, BM, and AM are quite close to the nominal level, 0 0.95. Okay, you see this is true already with this model sample size. So this is quite reassuring, I would say. And uh, so this is uh, producing data from a half Cauchy, but similar results you can, on, can also be obtained, for example, from a gamma 2, 2, which is in the maximum of attraction of a gamma distribution. So here you have exponential type tail behavior, or if you, for example, consider a short tail distribution in the domain of attraction of a white ball. Okay, so uh, this is all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. And as a final, uh, Think, let me uh, just uh, uh, mention that if you're interested in extremes, uh, we are going to host at Bocconi University in Milan uh, next uh, extreme value analysis conference. Uh, unfortunately, um, abstract conditions are now closed, but still, if you want to participate, registrations are open. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefano, for the nice, very nice presentation, and also to be perfectly on time. So, are there any questions from the audience? We have time for one quick question for sure. So there is a question in the chat. Is there a reason why you, are, you leave out the case where eta may have mass on the edges of the simplex? Uh, yes, <laughs> this is a good question, um, and this is a very relevant point, actually. Uh, yes, the reason is that, uh, um, as usual, I think uh, you need to find a good compromise between the, data inf the, inf the amount of information you have in your data and the complexity of the model you consider. Theoretically, to construct a model for the angular measure, it's perfectly legit to have mass on all the edges, right? In practice, then to learn such a complicated measure uh, is difficult from the statistical viewpoint. So what we had in mind is to consider a scenario where both the mathematical aspects and the 
practical inferential aspects will be under control. I mean, the complexity of the measure explodes very rapidly as the dimension increases because the, 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 all the, the number of subfaces of the simplex is a sum of uh, binomial coefficients, and this re really goes up uh, very quickly. So we wanted to have, as a first step, something which would be reasonably under control. So I think potentially you, in this approach, you could perfectly consider mass there and model them with polynomials. But of course, then you pay the price of having something, something more complicated and uh, things become more difficult. Thank you for the question. Other questions? There's still time for another one. Don't be shy. So, okay, maybe have one very quick. Uh, I'm not an expert of extreme value theory, so it's just like a curiosity. If, for instance, at least uh, mathematically, um, this setting can be extended in, I don't know, in an infinite dimensional setting. That is for the study of processes, you mean? Yes, exactly. Again, uh, it depends what you want to do. If you want to work on processes, you already have the difficulty that you are not really working just with a big uh, uh, multivariate distribution, but you're working with a process. And then uh, depending on the type of process you're studying, is this temporal process, is this a process in space, which is the case I've seen most of the times for max stable processes. Then you need to make sure also the trajectory has some properties and uh, the, the, the setup is already complex. So, uh, and then you want to carry out inference. So if you want to be able to carry out inference having a process with a given structure and then being non-parametric can be very complicated. So at, at some point you need to give up somewhere, I think. For sure, what you can do with max stable processes is to uh, work with empirical base for modeling the margins, that for sure. Then, depending on the dependent structure, it depends what you want to do. It can be that in many cases, a complicated but parametric model could be already enough. It depends. Thank you. So, thank you, Stefano. Let's thank again Stefano. And we can continue with the second speaker, Nicola. So, please, Nicola, share your screen. Yes, thanks, Alicia. <clears throat> One second. Um, yeah, don't worry. Thanks. You can already see or not yet? Not yet. OK, now. OK, okay. thank you. So now it's. Uh, Nicola Stern, and I will present Extrema Random Forest. So this, Nicola, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Alessia. Thanks for the kind invitation and organizing the, the webinar. <laughs> thanks also, Andre, for the introduction. And thanks, Sebastian, for agreeing to be the discussion today. Today, I will talk about this project, which is named uh, Extrema Random Forest. and which is joint work with uh, Edossa Terefe, who is a PhD student at the University of Avassa in Ethiopia, and who was a visiting PhD student in, in Geneva, and Sebastian Engelke, who was my PhD advisor in Geneva. Um, the goal of the project is uh, to, est uh, to estimate very large quantile, so in a quantile regression setting, when possibly the, dimen the, the dimension of the predictor space is large. So here is a, a running example that I will refer to uh, in the following. So here the setting is as follows. We have an independent copies of a pair of predictors X, which we assume to live in a compact 
space, in this case, a uh, compact uh, unit I hypercube, and a response, real valued response Y. Here, our target of inference is the conditional quantile of Y given some predictor X, which is defined if we assume that uh, the um, distribution function is continuous and strictly monotone is the inverse of the conditional um, CDF. And the goal, as I said, is to estimate this conditional quantile function for very high threshold levels. So when tau is very close to one, informally speaking, and when possibly the dimension of the predictor space is large. And the application uh, of this uh, problem can range uh, from in very diverse fields, for example, in earth system science, when one is perhaps interested in studying, I don't know, rainfall, very large rainfall, depending on space, time, and other covariates, but also in insurance, when one, where one would like, for example, to predict very large claims from a specific, uh, um, say, um, client, conditioning on its demographics, for example. So here in this problem setting, we are facing two challenges. So the first one is the following. While there exist many uh, well-established methods in quantile regression to estimate even flexibly quantiles at moderate levels, say 80%, where you have data both uh, above the in, uh, quantile level of interest, the first uh, um, difficulty or challenge that we have to face is that our target of inference is a quantile that is very large, for which there might be very few or even no data points above. In this case, for example, is the quantile with five in a thousand occurrences. Also, the other difficulty is that we might have a predictor space that is large, even if it's fixed, can be large, and the profile of the quantile curve can be quite complex. And so we have to address these two challenges, very high quantile level and possibly large predictor space. Regarding the first challenge, we will rely on extreme value theory and in particular on the generalized Pareto distribution extrapolation, which is a re famous result in extreme from Balkema and De Han. And the intu intuition is as follows. So suppose that this is uh, the response Y, and we consider the density, the conditional density at a certain predictor x evaluated at a little x. And say that we are interested in estimating a very large quantile. Here it's y. Well, then this, is my, this might be very hard to do it empirically because, as I said, there might be few or even no data points exceeding this quantile. So what one could do thanks to extreme value theory result is the following. Actually, one can, in fact, approximate the quantile of interest as follows. As a baseline, which is the intermediate threshold or quantile, which here in the diagram is the, the point Q, and this can be estimated with classical standard quantile regression methods. And on top of that, one can add this extrapolation term, which depends, as you can see, on two parameters, which are the parameters of the generalized Pareto distribution, the shape parameters that governs the heaviness of the, the tail and the scale. And this extrapolation term is motivated by, in fact, the Balkema de Han theorem, uh, yeah, which is basically uh, the, the extreme version of the central limit theorem for like uh, data over a certain threshold. Now, in this project, we make the modeling assumption that our quantile a uh, very large quantile depends on the predictors X, not only via the intermediate quantile, but also via the parameters, meaning that the scale and shape parameter can change in the predictor space. Now, this is what we do to address the first challenge, how to deal with very large quantile. But then of course, we have the second challenge, as I mentioned, how do we deal with possibly large dimensional predictor space? And for this, we rely on random forest. So of course, random forest, the first thing one thinks about it is just, okay, this is an ensemble methods used to predict, uh, putting together prediction over several trees. And for example, 
this is what I also was thinking before like diving into this project. However, there is an alternative view of random forest, which is also very helpful. And in the case, for example, of regression random forest, one can think of the prediction given by a certain forest, mu hat, at the predictor point little x can be seen as the weighted average of the response where we are using these weights. These weights tells us, tell us somehow how each observation i is close or far to the fixed predictor point little x. These weights are localizing weights, which are automatically, or you know, let's say, yeah, are automatically learned by the random forest by averaging over several trees. And they can be thought in a sense as a, as a kernel with the difference, of course, that with the kernel, you have to pre-specify the kernel and possibly also choose a bandwidth. Whereas here, these weights are really learned by, by the individual trees and then aggregated with the forest. Of course, there exists several types of random forest. And the most classical one that we know is the regression random forest. But depending on the type of random forest you use, you get a different type of localizing weights. And here I want to give a bit of intuition to why uh, and what happens if you use different type of random forest. So in the classical regression random forest, the target of inference is the conditional expectation. And therefore say that you would like to make some prediction at point 0, point, point 0.5, then the weights that the regression forest will learn will try to capture the variability in the conditional expectation, okay? Here we see, um, however, that the conditional expectation of Y given X is constant, and therefore, ideally, the optimal weight of a regression forest would be constant, meaning to predict at point 0 0.5, you would use with equal weight all observation because they carry the same information with respect to the conditional mean. On the other hand, if you would like to learn, say, 90% or 10% quantile on this data set, would be better to use a random forest geared for this purpose. And this is, for example, what we use in this project, which is the generalized random forest. Generalized random forest for quantile task, what we'll do is the following. If we want to make a prediction at 0 0.05, well, it will ideally put positive weight on all observation to the right of zero because they carry all the same information for the 90% quantile and they will place zero weight. So the localizing weight will be zero for all observation to the left of zero. So we see that depending on the random forest of choice, you will have very different localizing weights that of course have different purposes. Now, of course, I told you how do we address the high quantile level challenge with extreme value theory? How do we address the large dimension of the predictor space with random forest, but how do we put these elements together? Well, here I take the step back to the extrapolation formula I presented. And as you see, we would like for a fixed predictor X to estimate quantile level tau using the, the, the extrapolation formula. Of course, the first ingredient we need to estimate is this intermediate threshold or yeah, intermediate quantile, and this can be estimated with existing uh, standard quantile regression methods. But now, more interestingly and importantly, how, do we, how can we estimate the two parameters from the generalized Pareto distribution, so the shape and the scale? So here we propose, since these parameters come from a parametric family, generalized Pareto, which has a, a log likelihood function, what we propose to do is to solve a, log -like, a maximum likelihood problem weighted by the weights that are obtained from a quantile random forest. So basically here, if we want to make uh, estimates uh, for the shape and scale parameter at point X, we would minimize okay, the negative log likelihood weighted by these localizing weights. Um, to give a bit of intuition, perhaps, I will show you how in practice this would happen. So again, I'm using the same toy uh, example with only one dimension here. And the first thing I would do to estimate this very large quantile 
is the following. First, I have to estimate the intermediate threshold. And to do that, well, I can use an existing method. And in this example, I'm using a classical quantile regression forest. And this is well-established method and it works well on moderate quantile levels. Now, the second step is to obtain or compute all the data above the threshold because these are the exceedances that follow in the limit, the generalized parity distribution. So these are the orange data points. And let's say now that I'm interested in, interested in predicting very large quantiles, say five in 10,000 at this point, minus 0 0.25. So what I do, I first recover, I first learn uh, localizing weights using a generalized random forest. And then I solve at this point here, the log likelihood problem to learn the generalized Pareto distribution um, parameters and then plug them in the extrapolation formula to obtain, for example, this value. Of course, this is a prediction at a single point in the predictor space, but I can repeat this procedure. And actually it's quite, it's very fast also computationally at all predictor points of interest so that I can obtain a quantile curve. And this quantile curve, of course, it's a toy example, but it shows that basically it's able to produce curves that are in fact extrapolating from the data. So here, for example, I show you the ground truth because this is simulated data. So you see that literally this is event uh, that occur one times in 2000 uh, observation. And in fact, there are one probably or even no observation above this. Now it's interesting to compare this estimation. So based on extreme value theory with what you would get if you were just to apply the classical quantile random forest here, the interesting but perhaps not so surprising fact is that you notice that no matter how large you want to ask, uh, no matter how large your quantile level is, the larger estimated quantile will always be no, no larger than the largest observation because these classical methods rely really on computing empirically the quantile and so they don't have this extrapolation power. Now, under certain simplifying assumption, perhaps I'm happy to discuss also later, perhaps also during the discussion, we are able to show that solving this weighted log likelihood problem, uh, of course, gives this um, estimator theta hat, which converges in probability to the corresponding um, ground truth pointwise in the predictor space. Okay. And I would say the most simplifying assumption that it's probably important to relax at some point is that we assume that the data, so here the exceedances in particular are exactly GPD. So somehow we are not considering the um, pre-asymptotic bias uh, in the proof. And this is something that would be important probably to, to extend to, yeah. And so to conclude, I would like first to show a brief simulation study to try to perhaps convince how the method that we propose tries to solve the two challenges I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, here, the simulation study uh, is built again on a data set that is very similar to the toy example. So as you see, you have the response Y depends on the first predictor X1 only via its variance, okay? So the variance for all data before um, less than zero is one and the variance or the scale, let's say, uh, for all the data to the right of X1 is two. And this is what we have in formula. So we have that X is uniformly distributed so over the predictor space. And then the conditional response, so Y given X is a student T times this scale, which is one if we are less than zero and two if uh, X1 is greater than, than zero. Also, we uh, here model this shape parameter as a constant, which is one over four which corresponds to four degrees of freedom in the student team. So we want to see how our method performs for different quantile levels and for different dimension where we add on top of the first dimension noise variables to see how well the random forest can handle large number of dimension, even if they're just noise variables. So basically it should hopefully disregard them. We compare our methods with other 
existing quantile regression approach. QRF and GRF are flexible methods, so based on random forest, but they don't have extrapolation power as uh, because they don't rely on extreme value theory arguments. On the other hand, extreme GAM, GBEX, and a method from Tayyarda, they uh, and co-authors, they all rely on extreme value theory, whereas uh, extreme GAM well relies on generalized additive model, um, which is uh, yeah less flexible in a sense than the uh, random forest. Whereas GBEX, for example, it's a uh, also a very flexible model because combines boosting, so from machine learning to, again, extrapolation arguments from extreme value theory. And how do we evaluate the performance since we generate the data? We know the ground truth, meaning the true quantile. So once we estimate a quantile, we can just compute the integrated square error or the mean integrated square error. So in the first picture here, I'm showing how the mean integrated square error, well, the square root of it, um, changes as we increase the quantile level. We see that all the methods are quite similar for small quantile levels, but as soon as we increase the quantile level, well, they start to depart from each other. And it's interesting because the ERF, which is a method that we propose, and also the other GBEX method, which is a method that tries also to combine the machine learning like flexibility with extreme value theory extrapolation, are the ones that kind of tend to perform best. Then it follows uh, these, uh, well, ERF and GBEX are followed by another extreme value method, unsurprisingly, EVGAM. Also EGP tail, it's a method that is based on extreme value theory. And then the last two, GRF and QRF, are based instead on, on empirical uh, quantiles. And that's why they don't scale so well for a large quantile level. At the same time, instead, if we see what happens to the loss as we increase the number of dimensions, it's interesting again to see that the best uh, two methods, at least in this example, of course, for a fixed large quantile, the methods that perform best, or at least are stable with respect to the dimension are all methods relying on random forests so, or, or machine learning uh, methods, which are flexible enough. So ERF, which is the blue one, the GBEX, and also the existing classical random forest ones are relatively stable with the dimension. Whereas, for example, if we were to use a more classical uh, extreme value theory approach that uses generalized additive models to model very large quantile, well, we see that while it works very well for moderate size predictor space, well, then its performance decreases quite uh, substantially uh, as uh, the number of noise variable uh, increases. So maybe I'll first ask uh, Alessia if um, there is still a couple of minutes um, because I- <laughs> Maybe two minutes, time. yeah. Okay, yeah, two minutes. Two minutes. more than enough, thank you. So now in uh, the last part, I want again to briefly uh, describe, illustrate what happens if you apply the method to real data. So here we use a data set that is quite simple in the sense that we have three predictors, age, years of education, and whether a certain person is black or white. And based on that, we try to learn um, high quantile of uh, the weekly wage. We use this data set because it's very large. It's uh, 60,000 observation, and therefore it's easier to validate whether we are performing uh, well or not, because one, difficulty of this, of course, extreme value quantile regression method is that once you make a prediction, well, it's very hard to validate because, well, there might be no observation above the quantile curve that you, that you produce. We also add 10 noise variables so that the data set, we also see how it handles with, with more dimensions. So here in the first plot, we just shows that the method is able to capture some sort of heterogeneity both in the scale and shape parameters for the years of education. So we see that there is a, at least a clear signal, whereas it, there doesn't seem to be like any signal with respect to the categorical variable, whether the person is white or black. On the other hand, with respect to the other um, predictor age, there seem to be no strong signal, at least with respect to the two 
GPD parameters. So here is again the scale and the shape parameters. Then of course, if we put everything together, if you remember the scale, shape, and the intermediate threshold, we can estimate then the very large quantiles. And here we estimate on the first row quantiles at 90% level, uh, on the second row at five in a thousand, so much higher. And it's interesting to see that when, when we are considering like moderate, large but moderate quantiles, different methods, so ERF, which is based on extreme, but also GRF, which is not based on extremes, they all look quite similar. However, as soon as we move up in the quantile, well, we see that only ERF and GBEX kind of retain some sort of variability in their quantile profile, whereas, for example, the standard methods uh, do not. So to recap, what I presented here is a method named uh, extreme or random forest that estimates conditional extreme quantiles in large dimensions. And it does so by combining extreme value theory to deal with large quantiles and random forests to deal with uh, large dimensions. And in practice, it's uh, very simple to feed and it is available as an R package at the moment uh, on GitHub. So if you're interested, the, the paper is available on, on archive for the moment. And thank you very much. Thank you, Nicola. There is time for a very, very quick question. Just one. Yeah, maybe I have a question. If if no one has has one, uh, yeah, there is one from Kafoskari and one point from John. So maybe first John and then Kafoskari extremes, which I don't know. Uh, Please, John. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to ask if your results also, if I got it correctly, does it hold for psi negative as well, or is it just for psi positive? That's a good question. Um, so um, the proof that we have at the moment, uh, we we proved for for positive psi, so that the parameter space. Uh, I yeah, see. Yeah. Where, well, it, it's less uh, cumbersome. However, in practice, though, in the simulation study, and uh, yeah, in the simulation study. We have simulations uh, for well, negative zero. Uh, I would say no zero, and positive shapes. So like exponential tails and heavy tails. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. So Kafoskari, just. Oh, isn't it? Uh huh. Yeah, that's a very good point. So um, we didn't specifically try to come up with a sort of feature importance uh, metric. However, what we noticed is that um, in this example for uh, where we have one variable that has signal and all the others, uh, because here we also generate data up to 30 predictors. So we have one signal variable and 29 noise variable. Well, then we see that the performance is quite stable and the splits, if you want, of the forest all occur mainly uh, along the first uh, the first predictor but yeah we didn't try yeah the variable only affects scale uh, yes but i would yes maybe i didn't fully understand the question um do you think it's um so when you mentioned a covariate has an effect probably you, you mean a, a location effect can you hear me now yes Thank you. Yes, sorry. Uh, so yes, so you. I think we have a couple of we have many questions. So thanks for the nice talk. First no, of thank all, thank you. Um, no, but indeed we were asking a if you had a sort of model selection metric as you as you mentioned, but the other sort of because you mentioned in the presentation that you could have uh, uh, some uh, changes also in the shape parameter, but in the simulation you're only allowing the scale to vary. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Actually, uh, in the in the manuscript, we have uh, more simulation where we also allow the shape to to change. Of course, it's much harder to capture variability yeah. in the shape. Yes, yes, this is also what we noticed. But we also have a simulation where we change also the shape at the same time. Yes. We'll look at it. Thank you. Thanks to you.
So I think and that we can, so after there will be now John talk, but and after the discussion, there will be also time to ask some other questions. So uh, we can move the other questions to, to the end, let's say. So let's thank again, Nicola. Thanks, and Alicia. And now is, is John's turn. Yeah. Um, okay, so I will do my sharing of the screen. So can everyone see my desktop now and now the slides? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so John will talk about predicting risks of temperature extremes under atmospheric blocking using our Pareto processes. So please, John, the floor is yours. Okay, very good. Um, so I just want to ask, uh, can you see my mouse moving around? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. So, hi. So, um, um, my name is Jonathan Koh. I'm a postdoctoral researcher um, working in Oshka Center for Climate Change Research at the University of Bern. So, firstly, I would like to say thank you very much um, uh, to all the organizers for organizing what has been, I would say, a really, really great and really interesting webinar so far on, I would say, co also covering different aspects of extreme diet theory. Um, and in this work, I'm going to be uh, shifting gears a bit now to, to a more applied, you know, or methodological side of extreme value theory in this work. And, and it's my great pleasure to tell you a little bit more about uh, what I've been working on for my postdoc so far. And I just want to start out with a small caveat that this, this is very much ongoing work. And the goal is to have a preprint out um, by, by this summer. So, so for those interested, I would encourage you to to swing by my website this summer to find out um, more about it. And my website is, is given this QR code over here. All right, so as, as I mentioned, my postdoc is under this broad umbrella uh, of the OCCR, this, this center. And, and why I'm telling you this is that it, it becomes relevant um, in, in my storytelling later, but uh, it, it's, it's, what's crucial is that it includes working both with the statistics department where I have my home base, but also the geography department. Um, and I think modeling and predicting extreme events from an applied point of view is, is a pretty difficult, I think, complex, but also very importantly, interdisciplinary undertaking. So, so the project um, started with this, at least my desire to, to, to merge elements of extreme value theory with, with elements of machine learning, as we have already seen, um, to, to solve um, a pretty complicated problem, complicated, but also very classical problem of, of temperature extremes. Um, and I think it's always instructive to, to at least give a brief overview how I got to this project. I think it's always interesting to hear in talks. So, so I thought I'll give my own personal experience of working in the Geography Institute as a statistician. So when I first joined, I mean, I was thinking about, you know, um, you know just this paper by, by, by David said, oh, this, this, this by now quite famous paper about uh, reviewing uh, statistical methods for, for spatial extremes. And these are actually um, things that they, they have already heard of. I mean, most, at least those who are more statistically inclined would have already heard of this. Um, also, especially, you know, with the GV and the GPD, this has really entered into this stream um, already in the past two decades, three decades or so. Um, but then what they would also be interested in actually um, uh, thinking about is about the drivers, uh, understanding what are the drivers of extreme events. You know, what is really... Um, so in, in essence, from a statistical, um, in the statistical language, not just the unconditional distribution of the response, but the conditional distributions of the response given some drivers or covariates, if you want to call it. And then I thought, okay, why don't we open calls 2001? Let's uh, try to incorporate these covariates in a linear fashion. So you have tons of methodology. I, I won't even bother um, listing some of them, but really um, trying to put covariates into, for example, parameters of the GEV or the GPD. And the problem with this is that many of the effects aren't actually linear. I mean, they could try to condense these covariates to indices. And then to, as, a, as an effort to move towards nonlinearity, I was thinking about you know, some work that I did for my PhD, trying to look at you know, smooth functions and how it would interact with respect to the season. And in this case, for example, I had the FWI, which was the Federal Fire Weather Index, um, how, how this effect would change across the, the wildfire season and, and how this would affect, for example, wildfire activity more, more generally. But of course, these are just mixed effects models and there are, there are countless others. Um, and, and of course, when you start to think about uh, moving away from the Bayesian fra uh, fra uh, framework more to the frequentist, thinking about spatial dependence, these are, these are also areas like, so in this work, 
what we did was uh, incorporate um, um, temporally varying covariates such as the telecommunicate uh, teleconnections and how it interacts with the month, you know, with, with spine basis. So, uh, and that assumes, of course, that you, you have a good idea of what the spine basis would be. And what we do here is, is to, to let the range parameter of, of a brown resonant model um, uh, vary with respect to these covariates. And there are others as well. So, I mean, these are just, uh, this is just one that was just released um, a few months ago with, with looking at our parameter processes and incorporating linear trends. Now, the, the problem is that they actually have thousands of covariates. I mean, a lot of times in these problems, they have they have a lot of covariates available, you know, with the release of error five reanalysis data. They have put a lot of potential nonlinearities. Um, so covariate selection came out just now about selecting the, um, the most relevant ones. They're not really sure which ones are relevant. Um, there are a lot of interaction effects as well, very, very complicated ways these covariates might interact with each other. And before my co-author can finish his, his sentence, I would say, okay, now say no more. Let's start working on this project. And, and the, this really leads to the real preview to this work, which is um, related to the previous talk, which was, which is also something I've been dabbling in since, uh, since 2021, which is to use uh, loss functions motivated by extreme value theory, so new loss functions, um, to be used in existing machine learning methods. Um, and and um, in the previous talk, uh, these, some of these uh, papers were already mentioned, but I started with this by personally from, from um, trying to deploy this model in the EVA 2021 data challenge. Um, but I'm, I'm by no means alone in this field. So it is a growing field. And the main idea about all of these talks, well, all of these uh, studies is, is uh, are essentially incorporating non-stationarity with respect to covariates into models motivated by um, extreme value theory in a nonlinear way. Okay? And, and, and that's, yeah, so this is the talk that Nikola just, just gave, which was, which, which it was a very nice method to, to train this random forest model, um, but also using uh, regression trees of this random forest. And, and here are these two um, other um, studies which, which use neural networks. Now, where our work comes in from a methodological point of view here is, is trying to fill this gap with going the same theme of um, doing machine learning, but for, um, for multivariate loss functions. So these are all actually univariate loss functions motivated by univariate extreme value theory. And now we're going to be drawing inspiration from all of this work, but also trying to model the spatial extremal dependence um, by looking at multivariate loss functions okay, motivated by extreme value theory. Um, and, and the methodology here, I would like to say, the, the, uh, it applies more generally, but I, I guess I'm speaking more to a statistics audience here, but, but truly the methodology was, was developed with this application in mind, which is to answer um, this question, this classic case study of, of temperature extremes. Now, um, I, I guess many of you are actually may already be familiar with this paper because it, it appeared in many newspaper outlets um, in, in the summer of 2022, but but in July 13, 2022, um, actually, the, our globe was, it was simultaneously being hit by multiple uh, heat waves at multiple locations. Um, and the area we'll be focusing on is this area of Western Europe, which has been recently identified as this hotspot for increased occurrences of, of heat extremes. So the objective of this work is, is really twofold. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's simple objectives, but complicated uh, to, to solve. Really, the first one is about predicting the occurrence probability, the intensity, and spatial dependence of heat extremes across Europe. So the full picture, in, 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 in essence. Um, the second thing is to identify the weather patterns driving these extremes, um, thereby advancing our understanding of heat extremes through this data-driven approach. Now, I, I say data-driven, uh, at least this is what my, my applied core to say, because we don't put any physics-based um, uh, modeling techniques into our model. What we do is we use these machine learning methods. Uh, we use the data to, to draw out what the weather patterns are, okay? And hopefully those make sense also from a physics point of view. All right, the nice thing about heat extremes is that it's actually a pretty textbook example. There's, there's it's a really classic case where we have a pretty good idea of the drivers. And, and the, the first, so it can be categorized into three main classes, which is the global thermal dynamics, which is due to do with climate change, essentially, okay? And, and this is something that we won't actually cover here. What we're gonna be doing is we're instead gonna be detrending uh, our surface uh, temperature anomalies. And we're gonna be looking at anomalies instead. 
what we will be incorporating into our model is, is this local land surface, which, which really determines the surface energy budget. Okay? So the, in other words, this wet soil buffers heat. And it, it, you know, uh, if you have a very dry soil, you're going to have very high temperature if you're being hit by a heat wave. So it's a preconditioning kind of it, um, effect. Um, and what I guess I will be focusing really a lot on in this talk is about regional dynamic conditions, which is to do with a, uh, diabetic uh, heating and adiabetic heating, um, where, where really um, this subsidence is really what is happening when air is coming down and causing a high pressure system. And this high pressure system um, um, is, is, is acting on the surface and, and this compression leads to this, this heating. Okay? And, this, and while diabetic is more coming from um, a radiation, Okay. And of course, there's also advection of warm air, you know, um, coming from the Sahara, if you're looking at Europe, uh, European region. And all of this is all coming from anticyclonic circulation. And when we talk about regional dynamic conditions, what we are really referring to are LUX, okay, which are periods of high geopotential anomaly, which is this strong anticyclonic behavior above this region. This is something we call uh, anticyclonic behavior. We're looking at really the geopotential height of 500 hectopascal, which corresponds to about 5,000 meters um, in altitude, which is, you know, at the mid troposphere. So what's happening in the mid troposphere is actually causing a heat wave. So this is really a snapshot of July 19, uh, 2022. And many of you remember probably that London was hit by this record uh, shattering heat wave. And this was caused by a block. It's something called block. In fact, it's like an omega block here or, or C wave breaking block. But but anyway, those are technicalities, but it's really characterized by a anti-cyclonic behavior here, most often flanked by cyclonic behavior uh, on, on the right. So there's negative anomalies here and uh, negative anomalies um, upstream, we call it, because this the, the wave, the jet stream is basically going from, from here to here, from left to right. All right, so, and then that motivates using this Z500. So Z500 is, is really this geopotential anomaly fields as a covariate, okay? And why do we use T minus five to T minus one? It's because, well, there are many reasons why we do this, but one of the things is we're really looking at the build up the heat extremes the days before. So we wanna capture the persistence of the Z500 field, not just the signal of the block. Um, um, yeah, no, mainly the signal of the block and not really the those transient uh, Rosby waves that, 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 that come into it if you take at just one snapshot. Um, why we take soil moisture, I already mentioned it's a preconditioning event. If the, the soil is dry over the last 15 days, you're going to have much more of an impact. So it's really this, this combination of soil moisture and Z500. And of course, this sets us up very nicely to be in the, the forecasting or, or predicting uh, prediction scenario where, where we look at the previous days to, to, to think about what the current temperature would be. Now, so I'll go through this really quickly, but really the, this is error five reanalysis data. Um, training period, 1979, 2020, we leave out the last three years for validation. And I think it's better to just look at pictures because uh, that's always funner. So the predictors, for example, are these Z500 anomalies, which are on a coarser resolution. And it, basically we're using each grid cell as a predictor in our model, okay? You might ask what now is extreme, and I'll, I'll talk about that in the next slide. And the response here is this study region over here in Central Europe, and then we, we choose a risk region, okay? And we want to use this to predict that. And how we're gonna be doing this is really we're looking at our exceedances, okay? So if we look at the random field of temperature anomalies, we can define um, these R exceedances of, of this form where we have a risk functional now exceeding some um, sufficiently high threshold U um, and, and now I'm just, just putting more pictures. This S is again, the study region here. Um, under more conditions, we can then condition on the vector of predictors. And if we do any sort of extreme value um, uh, question, you want to answer some, some sort of what's probability of, 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 of a high impact but low risk um, uh, probability, it's, it can be decomposed as um, the exceedance probability in the first term and the term involving something called the generalized R prior to process in the limit. Okay, so this is the limiting model. Um, and, and this can be decomposed into the intensity and the spatial dependence. Now I deliberately colored it uh, red here because I'll be fitting these three models um, actually separately and um, con uh, consecutively from the intensity, then using the, in the estimates of the intensity to, to, to look at the spatial dependence. Okay, so again, we have to choose some, some risk functional. And, and here we chose this region here where, uh, because this is really high impact, high population density region. 
So very simply how we do this, just to get it out pict pictorially, is, is we, we have all these daily uh, extreme two meter daily te temperature anomalies over land. Um, we have a risk functional, we sort them into extreme and non-extreme. And to, to recap, these are the ones where the risk functional exceeds some threshold yield here. So it looks something like that. Okay, and the idea is just, we want to use these 500 hectopascal geopotential anomalies average over the last five days uh, on one uh, um, on the previous day to predict what it would be, what, what the temperature would be, okay? And the model we'll be using uh, very quickly is just gonna be relying on boosting of regression trees. Okay, and I, I think um, um, I won't spend too much time in, in, into what these are, but really regression trees are just able to have automatic covariate selection. Um, they are able to model non-linearities and interaction effects by construction. Uh, and actually we're gonna be considering the space of regression trees, right? Um, and that's what boosting is. Boosting is just a linear combination of these trees where this F here is this, this space of regression trees that, that I was talking about. Um, so, the point is that you do that al these algorithms, machine learning algorithms, would need to, for example, learn uh, M, the number of trees, and also how to construct these trees, how these trees are constructed. I, here, I just gave you the tree, but actually, you would need to construct these trees. And how this is normally done is in, in machine learning is, is always very typical. You just have some measure of complexity here okay, with, with an objective function equal to some measure of complexity, and then you have the loss function here. Right. What I want to say, to say, why I put this slide here is also because these loss functions, most of the time you have to come up with the gradient and the Hessians. And for custom loss functions like I have, I present here, these are, these are, these are pretty nasty, um, but they can be done. Right. So how the models are, so remember I told you there are three models. And the first one is simply just looking at the, the indicator, using the indicator as, as responses. So these indicators of whether or not there was an R exceedance, so one or zero. And here we can just draw from you know our our big uh, bag of, of of loss functions to, that are ideal for for modeling these kind of exceedance probability. Okay, and here we it would be the log loss, and the prediction would, would be the probability of exceedance. Okay. The second part is is related to um uh, to the univariate loss functions I I, I mentioned, um, which are motivated uh, by, by univariate extreme value theory. So like the GPD, the negative of the uh, GPD log likelihood, for example, would be a loss function. And, and here we'll be only considering uh, squiggly T here where the set of days where you see an R exceeds, okay? Equals to one. So and that's why this indicator goes in here. And so I won't spend too much time into this. Just know that this is really a variation of, of, of some of these, um, um, loss functions that I mentioned about that are based on univariate extreme extremes, right? What we have here instead of learning the psi, what we're actually gonna be doing is we this psi is actually homogeneous across the spatial region okay? in this whole R parameter uh, uh, process framework, okay? And, and this is actually a hyperparameter which we choose by cross-validation along with, for example, the, the number of trees. So how this would really concretely work in the data would be, okay, let's do a grid search of psi with respect to M, number of trees and then and then look at how the loss develops in a validation score this is with a five-fold cross validation this random four cross validation and and you can already see that uh, a pattern starts to emerge where you have something like close to minus 0.35 uh, i think this was chosen to be to be the, the minimizer and this makes actually quite a lot of sense um uh, from a temperature extremes point of view because you know these 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 uh, processes are actually bounded um, uh, have, have, a, have a natural upper right bound just based on physics. Now this is, I think this is the, this is the fun part, which is, which is to use really the gradient score of an R per to process as a loss function to be used in uh, a machine learning algorithm, right? And, and first what we have to do is we use predictions from, um, from the intensity model, um, which is quite common in copula model, modeling where you, you, you fit intensity model, transform it, and then you look solely at the dependence uh, or the copula if you want to call it. Uh, and here we have a, a brown resin model for the R Pareto part, uh, which um, we here assume to have a, a, a spatial dependence governed by uh, by a covariance function C here. Okay, and, and these uh, and this is quite familiar to some of you. This is just an exponential covariance function. And here we predict actually what the parameters um, of uh, governing the spatial extent of of the brown resin model are. 
um, using Kubernetes in this boosting algorithm. Okay, so this is the the, the workhorse um, that we're going to be using. Okay, and um, yeah, I won't have time to go through these, but uh, basically, this is this is a lot of this is actually quite computationally costly if we actually do this for every iteration of the boosting algorithm. So instead, we are actually going to be trying to simplify um, computation there as well. Now, very briefly, the model is just then this. I mean, just to have a pictorial view of everything, this is just we have the exceedance property, we have we have all these data of y y t um, prime. Um, and then and we're going to be fitting um, lock loss uh, with a lock loss um, loss. Okay. And then, then we're going to be only focusing on the extreme events. And then we're going to be fitting the marginal extremal intensity and then the spatial extremal dependence. Okay. Um, using the help of covariates and using these uh, loss functions um, that I, I mentioned before. And that's basically the model, these three sections of the model. And now it's the perfect time with two minutes, I will tell you a little bit more about the second objective, which is to identify the weather patterns driving these extremes. Right, the nice thing about these machine learning algorithms, such as boosting, is we can get some idea of which variables are important. Okay, and, and the results actually are pretty interesting because the red ones are the occurrence models, the, uh, the blue ones are the intensity models, and the black ones are um, different as different parameters for the dependence model. And this shows that it's not just what's happening above the study region, having a block here, you know, this anti-cyclonic behavior over here and then uh, cyclonic behavior over here, but also what happens at the flank of the blocks. Okay, so like what's happening over here, what's also happening here, for example. And here is my favorite one, which is really the onset of the block and right? you know, how the block was built up. Because remember, we're looking at the, the past five days. Um, and, and this is better shown if you, let's say we just, um, we, we fitted our model, now we, we, we predict on our training data, and then we sort the days by the, the 90th highest predicted probability days, uh, lowest 10% probability, uh, pro predicted probability days. And then we do a composite plot, which is quite common in, in these applied fields, where we take the averages and you can see um, uh, these kind of patterns that start to develop. And this is with soil moisture, and here again, we have this high pressure system. We have a very strong block over here. Um, and, and, and for the ones that we don't predict it to be so high, we have, we, we have a less um, strong block over here. And that is with the red points over here. So the anti cyclonic behavior here, cyclonic behavior here. So blue and the red. Now, this is where it starts to get even more interesting is because, you know, for example, this steep and elevated um, uh, trough is what actually causes this cyclonic behavior to develop an anti uh, sorry an uh, an anti cyclonic behavior to develop uh, this cyclonic behavior here and that's actually the reason why we see that these points here are also relevant these regions here are also relevant so really it's really to do with the um the, the edges of the block which are also really important for the intensity and if we look at spatial dependence um this is just looking at the temperature uh, average across those days um so i just simplify and say these are the tall kind of extremes they look like this um, and really, as I said, what occurs on the flanks um, of the troughs and the ridges of, of these waves are also in, important. And also here with the onset of the block. So here, if you know, this is where the, how the uh, this is where the block actually builds in the Western Atlantic before it actually reaches Europe. And the similar thing is also for the width, and it's also where where the block is actually located. So, you know, if it's located um, really directly in Central Europe or really just above. Okay, I won't have time to go into this, but I think the blocking situation looks very different from one heat exchange to the other. And I think it was really nice to, at least a surprising result, to see that these actually correspond to, to some of the different shapes of blocks that, um, that are, um, are, are, are in the literature. Um, for example, in, in this paper by Team Bullings and co authors in 2018. So many times anticyclones are flanked like cyclones, but sometimes they're located upstream or downstream or to the south of the block. And these are these are different types of block, which which you know snapshots of of, of the Z500 anomalies, which cause a different type of um, heat extreme. All right, so I think I will wrap up now. Which is really this is this is ongoing work. Um, as I said, this is really just um, uh, the preprint is expected to be out this summer. And just to wrap up this, for the first time, we're able to use these limiting parametric models, um, not just to answer stuff about occurrence intensity, but about spatial dependence of extremes. With that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, John, for your very interesting talk. So now it's time for...
one quick question, one or two maximum. So I have one. Uh, do you think that the, let's say, the geometry of the earth, so the fact that the earth is curved, will impact a little bit your uh, your methodology? Yeah, no. This is something we do um, we do take into consideration. So the latitude and longitude is not uh, this measure of distance uh, because you know uh, this uh, we're using Euclidean distance here. So, so if they are far apart, um, I mean, one latitude um, uh, uh, nearer to the poles is very different from one latitude. And so, so this is something that we do consider as well, um, where we take this measure of distance to be the Euclidean distance, where we model these spatial models. Okay, thank you. So, Andrea has a question. Thank you. Yes, a great presentation. Just asking about the time dimension, is it specifically considered? I mean, could you even have a mixed frequency data or any other time dimension in uh, the model? Thanks. So, so um, actually, I mean, I, I skimmed this over this part, but, but when we fit this model, it's actually, we assume um, conditional independence given the covariates. So we're not saying that, um, uh, this is also one of the reasons why we don't have to decluster the data, in, which is common in, in extremes, um, in, in time, decluster in time. I mean, because we assume conditional independence given the covariate. So, so, so it's not independence in time, but because the blocking situation will, will incur this um, dependence in time, if you want to put it this way, because the blocking situation are covariates which, which vary in time. Um, so in, indirectly, I think that that is the time dimension coming into the into play. Okay, thank you. I, 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 there's a comment about time space uh, separability. I mean, I don't think we're we're not dealing with a um, dependence a covariance. Um, I mean, we could, I guess, but you know, it's not a covariance function that is space time covariance function. It's not a separable space time covariance function. It is at each time point um, a, a, a covariance function in space. So. Okay, thank you again, John. And now it's time for our discussion. So I invite Sebastian to share his screen. So, yeah, okay, please, yeah, Sebastian, the floor is yours. Can you see and uh, see the slides and hear me? Yeah. Okay, excellent. So thanks a lot for uh, the organization of this nice event. And uh, yeah, thanks to the speakers for these excellent presentations. I really think that the presentations that we saw give a good uh, overview of what is currently uh, being researched in the field of extreme value theory, going from kind of uh, fundamental results uh, of uh, asymptotic theory of a new methodology often involving machine learning uh, tools and then up to applications here in a very important field of uh, climate science. And I'm now going to try to briefly summarize each of the talks in chronological order and then give some ideas uh, or some, some comments that I had when uh, hearing the presentations and reading the corresponding papers. So I'll start with the Stefanos uh, talk who presented a new uh, Bayesian paradigm for semi-parametric max stable distributions. And he considered um, the class of max stable densities that are parameterized by uh, theta, which are the parameters of the marginal uh, generalized extreme value distributions, and then the dependence parameter, which is the non-parametric part uh, eta, um, which models the so-called angular measure uh, of the max stable distribution. And he, um, yeah, he suggested to do uh, to model this with, in a non-parametric way using uh, Bernstein polynomials. And then he allowed very general priors uh, for uh, theta and for eta. 
So the main contributions, uh, some of the main contribu uh, con contributions of uh, Stefano's work, I think, are that he really, uh, in this generality, established uh, kind of a new framework, uh, Bayesian framework, for this uh, modeling of Martwitt max stable distributions. And what I think is, is very nice that he managed to prove theoret theoretical guarantees for the posterior distribution, which if you've worked with asymptotics in extreme body theory is really something that is not easy. And something that I appreciate a lot about these results is that he actually managed to uh, obtain as well results that hold for the misspecified case um, that actually always arises in practice where um, the blocks or the, uh, over that we take maxima have finite length and therefore the data are only approximately max stable distributions. Um, and that means that uh, our model is uh, uh, misspecified. And in this case, really this kind of domain of attraction case, it is even more difficult to obtain theoretical results. And so, yeah, I think it's very nice that he managed uh, to get uh, these theoretical results even for this misspecified case. So some points of discussion. So first, uh, I think it's interesting to uh, know more about the implementation and computations because uh, as you showed the posterior, um, um, the posterior of, the, of this model contains the max stable density in the integral and max stable densities are actually extremely costly to evaluate even in moderate dimensions. So I'm, I'm wondering how this in practice is possible to implement. And so you mentioned that in the end that there might be some adaptations that are needed here. Then related to this, in many applications, while the dimension will be fairly large, as we've seen in climate science, uh, environmental sciences, and non-parent models may be nice for, uh, for low dimensions, but how do, does this model perform in, in larger dimensions, where uh, well, maybe the non-parametric uh, fit of the angular measure is no longer uh, so suitable or suffers from the um, uh, from the curse of dimensionality, um, but also, yeah, as I said before, in these implementations, how is it even possible to estimate such a model um, with these max stable densities? Now, a third comment is in terms of sparsity, and this uh, relates also to the question asked by Richard Smith. Um, so you're saying you're modeling the uh, angular measure, so here in three dimensions, um, which can have many subfaces. So this has the interior and it has the corners of this uh, simplex and you are restricting your model to the case where you only have mass on the corners and in the interior, but not on the remaining subfaces, for example, these, uh, these uh, edges here, these, uh, these lines. In higher dimensions, you will have many more subfaces. So I was wondering um, whether it's possible to somehow um, have a natural Bayesian way of detecting whether uh, there is mass on subfaces. And I'm saying this because there's a, uh, a large body of literature on this problem of detection of uh, mass on subfaces of the simplex. And yeah, for example, in this review here, uh, we discussed some of those. So yeah, I was wondering if some of these methods actually carry over to the Bayesian case. Okay, now I'll uh, go to the uh, second speaker, Nicola, who presented uh, some work on extremely random forest where he looked at a, a unibrate response variable y, uh, and his example was weekly wages and um, a set of predictors that might be high dimensional. In his application, it was socioeconomic variables. And he's interested in um, estimating the probability of this response in some extreme regions. So for example, the probability that y exceeds a very large threshold um, conditionally on a set of, of predictors x. And what we do in extreme body theory is to re rewrite this with a, a base formula um, so that we actually have here, con here condition on uh, the event that y exceeds a moderate threshold u. And we do this because then we can actually rewrite this probability here by approximating the conditional law of y given that y exceeds this moderate, uh, moderately extreme threshold um, by approximating this um, by a generalized Pareto distribution. And this has a nice parametric form. And yeah, in, in the case of Nicolas' talk, this was conditional. So he then modeled this conditional generalized Pareto distribution with random forest. So the main contributions is, uh, of this talk, as I see it, are uh, that he proposes a flexible and easy to apply method with very few tuning parameters for extreme quantile regression, namely based on, on, on uh, ensemble trees. And he shows that in simulations, this uh, method outperforms classical machine learning methods that do not use this extrapolation, and also classical extreme value regression methods that do not 
have this flexibility from machine learning methods. So he kind of combines the best of the two worlds. And he's also able to prove consistency uh, for the conditional GPD parameters for arbitrary regression functions. Now, some comments. Um, so I believe that validation and tuning are very important for extreme value methods that use machine learning tools. And this is also uh, extremely uh, difficult, I think, uh, because in extremes, we would like to evaluate uh, extreme properties of our distribution. And uh, well, often in practice, we don't have enough data to actually get a good estimate, empirical estimate of those. So I'm wondering if uh, you can comment on um, yeah, how this can be done, how tuning parameters can be chosen, which loss we should actually use for validation of uh, these extreme value methods. The intermediate threshold is always a problem. Now, uh, in this case of uh, um, machine learning tools for extremes, how much of an impact does this intermediate quantile level actually have? And is it maybe possible to cross-validate uh, the choice of the intermediate threshold, or do you think this is not a good idea? Now, in terms of the theoretical guarantees, um, well, as you already said, you make some simplifying extension, uh, um, assumptions. Is it possible to extend the theory to data that is in the domain of attraction to derive asymptotic normality? Or do you have any comments on this? So the third speaker, uh, Jonathan, um, presented something that is actually quite related to what Nicola did. Um, so he's now looking at a response variable Y that is not univariate, but instead a random field. So uh, in his example, temperature anomalies in space. And uh, his predictors X are again uh, multidimensional, uh, in his example, geopotential height and soil moisture. And he's also interested in estimating now the probability that this uh, spatial uh, field takes values in some uh, risk set or some extreme set, extreme scenarios, for example, heat waves that have a certain form, a certain extent. And he wants to do this conditionally on some covariates. Um, so the problem looks very similar. And we could rewrite this again with base formulas, just as we did uh, in, or just as Nicola did in his talk. Um, however, now this uh, probability that Y is uh, larger than U doesn't make any more sense because Y is a spatial process. So in fact, we have to kind of uh, define what we mean with a spatial field being extreme. And for this, uh, Jonathan used a risk function um, that kind of maps the spatial field to real number. And then we can define what we mean with extreme by saying that this risk function applied to the spatial field uh, should be large. And then, well, we again have this conditional probability of Y, not the spatial process, conditioned that the risk function of Y is large. And now this can be approximated in a similar way, only that now this conditional distribution of the spatial field, given that the risk function is large, is not approximate by a univariate Pareto distribution, but by a, uni but by a, a spatial generalized R Pareto process. Okay, but the kind of the principle is really similar to uh, what is done in the universe case. So the main contributions of uh, Jonathan's work, I think, is uh, are that they, he, for the first time, combines spatial extreme value modeling with uh, complex predictor dependence to uh, model yeah, the spatial extreme events um, where the dependence structure can change with uh, covariates. And uh, he actually has a new way of fitting this. He fits all parts of his models through efficient gradient boosting algorithm um, with, which I think is very uh, nice, tailor-made loss functions that have tailor-made to these extreme um, models. And he applies this methodology to a real important question, namely how we can better understand extreme food waves. So some uh, discussion points. So I have the same question about validation and tuning for, for Jonathan, and maybe here it's even more important because boosting has many more tuning parameters than random forest. So same point. Um, selection of the risk function. So how do you actually select this risk function? Is there some subjectivity that actually may lead to selection bias? Because you might actually look at particular places in space where you know that these are high impact regions or that a lot of heat waves occur at this, uh, at this region. So there might be some uh, selection bias um, that uh, goes into your inference. In terms of identification of drivers of these heat waves, you show uh, ver variable importance of individual var variables, but often it might be a combination of very complex combinations of different climatological variables that actually lead 
to extreme events and how can you actually um, from your model obtain uh, more information on these kind of more complicated uh, combinations of climatological uh, drivers. And the last one, uh, kind of more qualitatively, um, someone as someone who knows now the climate uh, science part and the statistical extreme value part, what do you think are methods that climate scientists actually need from the stats and extreme value community? So yeah, with this, uh, I think uh, I'm uh, finished with my discussion. I'm very interested to hear what the speakers uh, have to say. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, I suggest to go again uh, chronologically, so starting from Stefano, then Nicola, and then uh, Jonathan. Okay, so first of all, many thanks, Sebastian, for the time you spent on having a look at our works and uh, preparing comments and questions, which are very insightful. So um, concerning, in a way, this course of dimension, uh, the first consideration I'd like to make is that I think there are different reasons, right, why a statistician may want to analyze a large set of variables together. And I think it's always helpful, as long as possible, to explicitly take reasons into account. So, for example, if many variables have to be considered because there are the record levels of an environmental phenomenon over different sites in space, we usually want to, of course, incorporate the fact that the dependencies to be modeled are special in our modeling strategy. And this uh, remains true even if we work parametrically, by the way. And uh, in a non-parametric setup, for example, even outside extremes, um, the Bayesian non-parametric methods of which I'm aware that maybe work with a big, let's say, but finite set of data, uh, looking at the joint distribution as the finite dimension of a special process. And they, work, they, they always try in a way to use special structure to introduce special structure in in the modeling so for example when they use this special Dirichlet process they for example uses a base measure that is a prior guess for the for dynamics for the variable a gaussian process where there is a special information inside so this is to say that uh, if we want to go high dimensional i think there is no a unique way to do it and uh, uh, the more so, for example, if in a special problem, you not, don't, don't just want to get to stop at the variables that you have at 10, but the more so if you want, even want to do imputation for location where you don't see anything, then the problem is even to model, modeling things in such a way that the process actually exists and you need a coherence for the parent structures in space. So things get more complicated. And in, for, for those, if I have to go high dimensional because I'm, I would need to deal with a special problem, First thing I would like to do is try to take this into account in a way. So um, what instead we did with Simone when we started working out this empirical based paradigm really had in mind the multivariate distribution without, for example, a special process behind it. So of course it would be interested to, interesting to, to, to adapt things to a special domain. Maybe some elements can be modeled para non-parametrically but being fully flexible, uh, I don't think it's viable. So this is the first consideration I wanted to make. And this, in a way, is also related to, to Alessia's question before. Um, again, the, the, the main point is that you need a compromise between the information that you have in your data and the complexity of the model that you want to infer. And uh, in a way, this also goes in the direction of answering to the other points, which, as you said, is related to Richard's question. Uh, mass outside, uh, let's say, the interior or the um, vertices of the simplex. Of course, I mean, mass in this subphase in the edges has the nice interpretation because it's linked to the occurrence of uh, exceedances in subgroups. So large values in subgroups of, 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 your, of, your, of the variables you are considering. So of course, this is nice from the modeling viewpoint. Yet to learn, uh, these measures can be can be difficult because, as you said, I mean, if you, the more so if you reading in moderate dimension, things get nasty. So my impression is that uh, from the mathematical viewpoint per se, maybe the analysis is complicated, but I I see no big reasons why it shouldn't work. On the other hand, uh, to make something sensible in practice, I think that anyway you need uh, some tools um, to, in a way, 
control the number of active SAC spaces in a way, or probably something to which you were referring to as um, sparsity tool. Uh, and uh, of course, to make things manageable, you need, you need something clever. What would be good of a Bayesian analysis in this, in this framework is that uh, Bayesian analysis provides in general, uh, natural approaches to model selection uh, and simultaneously with estimation. So this would be the, what I would consider the advantage of a Bayesian approach. Still, uh, you need somehow to keep complexity under control. So for example, in more standard problems like regression, many tools have been proposed over time uh, that allow to navigate to very big covariate space and uh, to, make, to produce sensible inference for uh, in the presence of very large number of, of, of covariates. But of course, to bring these tools to the Bayesian domain is not immediate because extreme value models have their own peculiarity. So I'm afraid that there is no clear answer so far, but it's definitely something we should think for the future. But, and uh, on the other hand, I think that if you want to allow for mass uh, on the edges, this is something you can certainly do but uh, except that you need to to stay in lower dimensions if you want to take it all in a way i hope this answers your question plus this is very last question very last thing before i for um one of the reasons why in the beginning we didn't consider mass on the subfaces is that uh, since we really had the perspective of having maxima uh, whose distribution is only converging to a limiting max table one we saw that for many examples uh, of uh, natural examples, let's say a multivariate distribution from which you could generate data and then compute maxima, the copula associated to this distribution uh, is in the maximum attraction of a distribution whose copula itself has an angular measure with mass either usually only in the interior or uh, you are in a asymptotically in, asymptotic independent setup where you have independent limit, asymptotically independent maxima and mass only on the vertices. And so this is why we thought that as a first step, uh, the, the assumption of having angular measures with just mass on vertices and the interior was a reasonable compromise between you know, something which is still manageable, but includes nice example considering the literature. For example, such as those that you have in your very nice paper with Clement Dombri uh, and, uh, and Marco Estin. So we thought it was a good starting point. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. So now, Nicola. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> and thanks, Sebastian, for um, the question and the nice uh, recap of all the three uh, presentations. So regarding the questions, so here I try to hopefully more successfully this time to share the screen. Can you see it now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So just uh, I also try to stick to the point. So the first question was about the validation and tuning. It is true that uh, it's uh, very hard uh, in extreme value theory settings to, to validate, especially the tuning parameters. So what we uh, did for the moment, and it's turned out to work uh, quite well, probably also because we don't have with the random forest too many tuning parameters to to, to adjust is to perform a cross validation. So at training time, we perform cross validation uh, using uh, as a loss function. Um, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, to perform, uh, we uh, perform cross validation using as a loss function the deviance of the generalized Pareto, and this uh, somehow is uh, turns out to be. Uh, the, to work quite well, especially for in our application. Uh, in particular, to be more concrete, the tuning parameters that we have to, that we adjust, we choose to adjust in our setup are the minimum node size for the random forest, which somehow controls the regularization. So how, uh, so if the minimum node size of each tree is very large, then of course the forest, each tree and therefore the forest, will not be very flexible, but of course we'll have less variance, smaller variance and vice versa. The other tuning parameter that we try to adjust is a penalty term that we add on top of the variability for the shape. 
because, um, of course, it, it is, as it is well known, estimating the shape parameter is usually a much harder problem than estimating the scale. Therefore, what we notice is that by adding a penalty term on the um, shape parameter, where we penalize variability of the shape in the predictor space, variability from its unconditional estimate, um, yeah, this gives also better results. And again, we cross-validate this using the, the deviance. Now, uh, regarding the intermediate threshold uh, concerning the simulation, we tried, of course, uh, using, uh, let's say, knowledge of the data generating process to see how different, uh, how was the impact of the different threshold on, on the performance. And of course, this, uh, on the one hand, depends on the heaviness of the tail, because depending on uh, the, the, the regime in which you are, so if the shape parameter is negative, zero, or positive, then uh, there, are, there seem to be different like sweet spots. Um, however, uh, what it turned out, like empirically, again, in our simulation, is that range is around like 80% uh, of the data, 80% quantile, so where we basically keep using 20% of, of the data as exceedances work uh, reasonably well. And of course, this is always about question about variance and, and bias, because uh, the higher the threshold, of course, the more we get into the extreme limit. So the bias disappears eventually, but the variance uh, grows uh, quite, uh, quite substantially. Finally, the, for the theoretical guarantees, yes, we are currently trying to extend the consistency result to the domain of attraction case. So it's still consistency results of first order. We, we, we first uh, use first order condition on the conditional distribution of Y given X. Um, we, can, we assume that the conditional distribution of Y given X is in the domain of attraction of threshold, so heavy tail. And from there, we are trying to establish consistency. Uh, of course, it's already more um, involved the proof because of course, first of all, we basically solve a, a maximum likelihood, which is somehow misspecified because we plug in data into the GPD likelihood, data that is uh, not exactly GPD. Uh, but okay, regarding consistency, it seems quite possible with some work to show consistency. Regarding asymptotic normality, I believe it's also possible, but definitely would be even more technical because, okay, first of all, one would need at least to assume second order condition on the conditional distribution of Y given X. But also one would need to be very careful on the second order condition of the weights of the random forest. So how fast they localize around a certain point because we are like still discussing about pointwise in the predictor space convergence. Uh, at the moment, so with the consistency, it is fine. So as long as the weights of the random forest localize in some sense so as the number of observations grow basically the weights are kind of narrower and narrower around the predictor point uh well it's possible to show consistency for asymptotic normality would be uh quite a bit more involved and at the moment i also don't have i would say concrete intuition on how the two second order condition from extreme and random force interplay with uh, with each other Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Thanks. Now, John. Yeah, Nicola, yeah. So, you can be sharing the screen because I, I, I think sure. it'd be better if we can uh, see what was the questions again. I, I probably, how much time do I have, uh, Alicia? I mean, as much time to answer. Uh, more like five, five minutes, yeah. Don't worry. Okay. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of uh, very interesting. So firstly, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Sebastian, for, for having a look at uh, the draft I sent you and also coming up with really, really insightful questions, I think. Tricky, but um, really, really nice questions. So the first thing is to do with this validation and tuning. So I think I will echo what Nicola said I mean, uh, and, and say that this is probably a very, very tricky problem uh, that we have in extremes in this field of extremes X machine learning. Um, and I don't think we uh, as a field have, have yet this like satisfying solution to this, this problem yet. Um, 
So I would say that um, diagnostic plots are probably, okay, before that, I mean, in, in our work, what we do is we use cost validation with, uh, like what Nicola did, which is the deviance of the loss. So we chose the loss function and we chose, oh, not deviance of the loss, sorry, but the, the loss function. So the deviance of the G, GPD or, or this, um, uh, or the grading score of the R priority process uh, to do cross validation. And it seems to work well ish. Um, but there is also this question about, um, uh, I think you also mentioned that there are many, many um, parameters to choose from, right? You need to tune many of these parameters in boosting. And that is true. And at some point, I think it's also about just making a choice and not do a full. Um, uh, Bayesian optimization on all the parameters. You know, you you make some sensible choices that okay, um, we allow for the 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 length of the tree or how deep the tree to be. You know, of five five levels. You know, um, so I I think that is probably what the and also it depends on your 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 goal. Is your goal to come up with um, uh, uh, to win a data challenge, in a sense, and to come up with these predictions that have uh, super deep trees of you know very very complicated uh, things, or is your goal also to un to 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 sort of uh, say something simple and have just a few parameters which you want to tune and some which you allow to be every at a reasonable level? I think it's a bit about about a compromise. Um, I wanted to also say about validation and tuning that um. Diagnostics, so validation more, not tuning, but validation. Diagnostic plots are probably the way to go here. Um, but but even then, so I'm in terms of spatial dependence, you you probably be familiar with, for example, looking in extremal coefficient is very classical, and then seeing that you know your model um, predicts that it goes through this cloud of points. But of course, that becomes even more complicated when you are looking at non-stationary dependence, where you have very complicated non stationaries and you can't really pull together empirical estimates. So, so one has to think about that even more as well. Uh, related to this, which validation tuning is also about model comparison. So if you're trying to compare two models, you kind of also have to think about how you would think about comparing two different models in terms of, the, of their score. And I think this work, a uh, very recent work by Bremer and Storkop um, about how proper scoring rules cannot differentiate um, or at least assess tail properties. I think this is something that is, is a huge um, 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 area that we should re really be looking at as well. And, and it's, it's something that actually um, my, my current lab is, is looking at um, in, at the University of Bern. Um, okay, um, so maybe I'll talk about, um, so the selection of risk function, I think, I think uh, I think this is also tricky. I, I think this will cause a selection bias if the region was was really purely selected in a data driven way, um, and and one can then ask, um, okay, even if in our case we chose this region because it's highly densely populated, you have regions of London, Paris, um, um, parts of Brussels, for example, but. Um, but in, in essence, it wouldn't be high impact if there were no heat waves. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg. Like people are interested only because of that. So I guess we have to be aware of this, but also try to not let our the selection of the risk region be data driven. In a sense, we don't want to snoop into the data and then let that drive um, uh, too much. We have to be tempted just to look um, at the, the fact that it's uh, high, densely populated and we choose this risk region by not looking at the data beforehand. Um, identification of, of drivers. I think I think the the my last slides uh, kind of hinted at this and what we're trying to do, where we take uh, the, the the top ten percent predicted and lowest ten percent predicted, and we look at these composite plots, which are actually quite common in in these applied fields, and it tries to to say something about. So I mean maybe. Um, um, Nicola, can you stop sharing? And, oh, well, I will, I will share, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I, I had this, uh, everyone sees this composite plot. Um, yeah, so this this was one of the composite plot, but so I, you know, I had this um, points where I had these dots on the field, which is which variables are important or which locations are important. But by looking at the, the whole Z500 field in, and, and looking at composite plots like this, it gives them an inter, um, um, 
uh, an indication of how it could potentially interact with each other. So for example, um, this area here with having an onset of the block being built up already in the, in the western part of the Atlantic, and then also having a, a red, a very strong block blocking event here. These are all complex interactions that you could kind of get uh, by looking at, firstly, by looking at snapshots of the days that uh, have predicted um, high dependence or just using composite plots like these. So, so that's the way that we, we try in, in our paper to, to, to look at these complex uh, dependencies. The last one is to do with um, challenges and I have, I have one minute, so that's great. Um, I think, uh, so I think that's a really tough question. These qualitative questions are always the hardest. <laughs> uh, probably I would say that actually many uh, climatologists are very statistically inclined. They know a lot about models. They, they, are, they fit a lot of very complicated models already. And maybe sometimes it's just going back to basics and to, to make sure that uh, we get the basics correct. Um, uh, I, I don't have an example now, but it, I mean, just, I mean, maybe examples of like multiple testing, how to appropriately use the bootstrap to get confidence intervals. Uh, these are all probably um, things that they would also could, could really benefit from statisticians from. Um, and not just always continually thinking about the most complicated, more and more complicated models. Um, yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. So uh, thank you for, uh, for this discussion. It was really interesting. And now there, is, uh, there are some questions from the chat. So one is for Nicola from Andri. Could any other extreme value distribution apart from GPD be used in ERF? And another one I think is for, for John, the last about applications. So maybe uh, Nicola can start replying and if John can yes. read the question and then can answer. Sure, uh, thanks Alicia. Um, thanks uh, Andre. yes. Um, so it's a very good question. Actually the generalized Pareto distribution, it is used because it is a limiting distribution to which, uh, well, a large number of uh, original distribution tend to when we consider the peak, this peak over threshold approach, basically, yeah. So we assume that the original distribution of the data, the, distribu the law of y given x, belongs to the domain of attraction with a diff certain index, which can be so sh short-tailed, uh, light-tailed, exponential, or heavy-tailed, and then, well, the theory and the extrapolation parts uh, is developed based on the on the bulk and Madehan theorem. Uh, I don't know if you perhaps men, um, ref, are, when you mentioned different extreme value distribution, you are perhaps referring to the other approach, the generalized extreme value with the block maxima or? Maybe you, you, you just have, I think, a question in the chat about this, but yes, I thought that of different- uh, Approach. Possibilities. Yes. Um, I think, okay, so um, I think it would be possible still starting from a general, so uh, starting from the, the, the block maxima approach to also uh, probably estimate the, the, the tail index and trying to localize in a similar way as we are doing here. The difference being, however, uh, that, okay, with the generalized Pareto approach, so with these peaks over threshold, we have this base rule decomposition as Sebastian showed, and then it's, it's possible to kind of invert and get the approximate quantile with extrapolation, which I'm not sure it would be possible with the GEB. Uh, yes, that's the difference I, uh, I would see between the two approaches. May I add another comment in this respect? Sure. I think also that there is more complicated because uh, if you want to justify your approach uh, for maxima in the extreme value theorem way, extreme value theory way, and then you have for each original data point a covariate, then you have blocks of variables, yes. each of them associated to covariates, then uh, how you get through? I mean, either yes. you think of maxima and the covariate associated to, with the maxima itself, 
And then, I mean, and then you kind of see, I, I'm already there. I'm already in the limit. And this is the covariate is the maximum. Yeah, that's but if you try point. to do the same thing you did for the GPD, yes. I don't think it's easy to do. So uh, I can see the point with the GPD with maxima. I think that will be much more complicated, okay. at least if but you want to try to go the same route and try to do the same reasoning for which you say, okay, with peaks, I take a large threshold and I exceed it. Yeah. And, yes. With max, maxim, I take blocks, but yeah, blocks if you take blocks of that. variables and then for each of the original variable, you have a covariate, how do you summarize the information? I think it's very complicated. Yeah, it's okay. That is a good point, Stefano. Yes. Thanks. I mean, would it, would, uh, if I could add, would it not make sense then to try to Look at covariates only on the scale of the block maxima. Uh, would that work in this? I wouldn't, right? Because then, because you still okay. look, at, you, you still only look at the covariates on the on the scale of the the same temporal resolution as your date of your response, of your original response. It, in a sense that it, could you so, you look at covariates, which is on the which which somehow summarizes that this is looking at the block maxima for this year. So instead of looking at covariate information at each day, for example, and you look at block maxima, you will look at covariates which are summarizing what happened yes. in the year. One example. block. Yeah, one block in a sense. I, would that work or? But then, uh, but then what I'm wondering is, okay, whether it is possible to learn these blocks automatically, right, with the for forest or, or just, because otherwise if yeah. I have more than one predictor, yeah. One could uh, say, okay, what is the uh, most reasonable way to kind of group the data and create the blocks? And so to do it like by hand, well, it's not clear unless there is domain knowledge. Perhaps it is possible, I don't know, with, in a data-driven way, but uh, honestly, uh, yeah, I wouldn't know like uh, now how it would go with uh, say also with the decision tree that tries to, to split and find the best block. May I also ask two questions? And we still have this question on applications in the chat. Just, but the question yeah. for um, Stefano and for Jonathan. For Stefano, um, 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 so you you used empirical base approaches, uh, uh, and you explained that be, uh, part of the reason is also that they are easier to apply than say non parameter base or similar possibilities. Are there any other advantages using empirical base here instead of other plant, plenty of uh, Bayesian possibilities there are? And also in empirical base, there are parametric and non-parametric options. And just shortly for Jonathan, a short question. Have you also explored the asymptotics of uh, your uh, approach? Thanks. Out of interest. Should I go first? Okay. Yeah, yes. So um, the main, so there are two main reasons in general to to, to opt for non parameter for let's say empirical based modeling of the margins at least. Uh, first point. So the first point is mathematical. Uh, when you want to study consistency of a posterior distribution, forget about mean specification and uh, uh, maxima in general. Uh, the, as unless you have a very regular parametric model, if you, the, the machinery proceeds in, a, in such a way that you need an integrable prior that assigns positive mass near the true parameter. Now, when you model uh, maxima, location and scale parameters may have a very weird behavior because, for example, if you are EV tail, they can go both to infinity. So how do you specify a proper prior which assigns positive mass to something which, as the block of the maximum increases, go to infinity? It's impossible. So having consistency there is very difficult unless you knew a clever way to rescale your initial kernel in such a way that you recenter it appropriately in a way you keep track of where the mass should be and then uh, we say okay we cannot do it we don't know how to do it at least in a 
genuine uh, Bayesian fraction, let's do it empirically. So this is, uh, I, I was studying empirical base for other problems. And uh, when we found out that we had this problem, I said, what Bayesian people do here where they really don't know what else to do is to use data dependent corrections to the prior. And this is what we did. So this is the main, uh, the main reason why. Uh, then, of course, uh, there might be other approaches, but uh, I was really focused in having proper kernels for, uh, for, uh, for, for theoretical reasons. And so this is why I didn't find any other possibility uh, being simple, because this empirical base strategy is really elementary. You have a sufficiently regular initial kernel. You can be anything, I mean, in the usual statistical uh, toolbox. And then you adjust it a bit. I, I, I don't think I, I couldn't think of anything simpler than this, still producing a, a proper prior distribution and uh, keeping track of where the mass should be. Thanks. Yes. Um, so, and your, your question is about asymptotics, right? Yeah. So, I think before we even think about asymptotics for this more complicated. Uh, you know, in the more complicated loss, the most complicated one, which is the, the gradient score, maybe maybe just trying to get it for boosting for uh, the GPD loss is, is as Sebastian knows, uh, not, not easy. I mean, I think Nicola is in a very special case with the random forest where you can describe it in terms of um, awaiting your, your, your observations. And that's the key there in, in that. Uh, we're boosting. Uh, I'm not aware of, of, of such... Uh, such an analogy. Maybe Nicola can can help me out here. Um, I'll, I'll I'll ask my ask a friend uh, uh, button in who wants to be your millionaire. And, but but I mean, would 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 what I said make sense, Nicola? I mean, from a first guess. It's uh, yes. Um, I I've never worked with um, like a theory of boosting, but what I uh, know like very high level about boosting is that like the estimate so the different so it's still an ensemble methods but what you put on top of each other is dependent data and this makes uh, the dealing with right with all the asymptotic analysis much harder whereas in the random forest somehow you still aggregate many trees but you grow okay the trees of course they are dependent of each other uh, because they use at least partially the same data but at least the way you grow the trees is usually uh, yeah. kind of independent. Uh, I don't know, perhaps, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I think um, I, 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 with, with an educated guess, um, I think it would be difficult. <laughs> um, I think it would be difficult, but um, I won't rule it out as impossible yet. And with the spatial dependence model, um, maybe with using random forest there, uh, we could actually explore something. I mean, it's, but this is definitely not the focus of, of this paper that we're writing at the moment. This is papers are very uh, more in the methodological applied side, but definitely from a theoretical point of view, that could be very interesting for that spatial dependence model. Uh, just to comment on this, maybe the, the problem with the GPD loss is that it's a non-convex loss. So if it was convex, I think then uh, even for boosting, you could have a chance of proving something, but since it's non-convex, I think it's it's very tricky. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe with your other loss functions, they, if they are convex, I don't know, there might be actually a possibility to proving uh, consistency. But yeah, GPD, I think the problem is the non-convexity. So maybe, John, if you can uh, conclude with the last uh, answer about application. Then... Yeah, but I think it's also probably relevant for Nicola. I think this is both from, um, this is, I think, just very general. It could also be relevant for Stefano. I think it's, it's uh, I think this is for, relevant for all. Um, it's really specifically on health and biostatistics. So I think everyone could comment on this. <laughs> um, how should we deal with this? Uh, I, I, I may, Maybe I'll just start uh, with one or two, uh, three sentences maybe about this. Okay, let me think. So I, I'm, I'm not sure if this, I mean, I would be surprised if it, like these techniques of boosting and all and random forest haven't been applied in public health or biostatistics. Whether or not it's, it's an extreme value problem is another thing, right? I mean, 
here you're understanding the drivers of adverse ev events for drugs or vaccines. So I think we've what we've been talking about are loss functions motivated by extreme value theory. So if it can be um, posed as an extreme value problem, then then I, I guess why why not? Uh, but I have I'm not familiar whether or not this has already been done. So you can, uh, Stefan or Nicola or Sebastian, you can add something if you want to this question. So yeah, I'm also not aware of applications in this field, um, but I think it's an interesting question. And especially maybe in terms of mutations of, uh, of cells and so on, there might be something where actually the extreme events might be very relevant for um, in this biostatistical setup. But I think it's, yeah, not typical applications of extremes, which are more in environmental, environmental science, climate science, maybe finance. But yeah, I'm not aware of biostats applications, but I think it would be interesting. Okay, so I think we can conclude. I would like to really thank uh, all the speakers for the high level, very high level talk. And for also for uh, thank to Sebastian for the very clear summary of the works and also about the discussion that generated a really uh, large number of in interesting questions also from the audience. So uh, I don't know if Andre you want to add something. Okay. Fortunately, we do not have at the moment the next webinar to announce, but likely it will be in econometrics in uh, ne um, econometrics of networks with uh, yeah later to be announced. So thank you all for participating also. Thank you everyone. Thanks. And thanks. Thank, thank you. you.